In our studies of the book of Hebrews, we begin with chapter 7. And um, from chapter 5 on, um, Paul has been working towards this chapter, uh, saying this is meat and um, <clears throat> preparing the reader, as it were, for, uh, for this, uh, to consume this meat. Uh, the theme is Jesus as our high priest, as our eternal high priest. And this was first introduced in chapter 2, in verse 17. And then uh, Paul began to explain the theme in chapter 5, in verse 10. But then he stopped. And uh, the rest of chapter 5 and chapter 6 were more of preparation um, of the reader, you can say. Um, so, after saying this is meat and... Uh, he, sort of rebuking the reader of being dull of hearing, uh, he then um, pointed their attention towards this theme. And <clears throat> by that he was realigning the reader with the importance of the gospel, of repenting, of not falling away, and of maturing. And now the time has come on the sub subject of the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. And this is um, a massively fascinating um, subject. And um, yeah, we're going to dive into this. It's meat, so not milk, fast in your seatbelts, I would say. And the question that we um, have to ask ourselves is, who is Melchizedek? Um, because he's mentioned so often in the book of Hebrews, and... Um, there is actually little known about him. It's a question that uh, has kept many theologians uh, occupied. And um, there are still many opinions, uh, differing opinions about it. So let's try to find the answer from scripture. Uh, we read about Melchizedek in Genesis. And in particular in Genesis 14 verses 18 through 20. So let's read that first and see what we have there. It says there, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him, and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him, that's Abram, gave Melchizedek tithes of all. It's these few verses that we have, these three verses, and that's all we read about Melchizedek. It's not so much info. Uh, so we need to do some forensics um, of sorts to get the full profile of this mysterious priest. Now, Hebrews 7, where we have landed, gives us more information. So I want to read the first three verses of that and so we can put things together. Hebrews 7, verse 1 through 3 says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abram returning from the slaughter of the kings, and blessed him, to whom also Abram gave a tenth part of all, first being, by interpretation, king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abided a priest continually. So we learn that he's both a king and priest, and that is a unique combination. Normally these offices were separated. And he was king of Salem. Now Salem comes from the word Shalom, which means peace. And the city of Salem is the ancient name of Jerusalem, the city of peace. We also read that his name is by interpretation king of righteousness. Now his name reveals a lot. So let's, let's look at his name and I will write down his name in Hebrew.
so this is how his name is spelled. Mel, uh, you would say Malki Tzedek in Hebrew. Malki Tzedek. It's basically two words put together. And that is as follows. So the first word is uh, melek. So you see that the kop, the third letter, I write differently um, here or there because it's written differently uh, depending on the place in the word. When it's at the end of the word, you write it like this. Um, several Hebrew letters have this and we find the same in Greek language. Melek means king. King. And then we have the word tzadek. And tzadek means righteousness and the yod in between connects the two words it uh, makes it possessive so you could read this in two ways you could say uh, um, king of uh, righteousness or uh, my king is righteous and, uh, because it's possessive you could say my king as well now the word melek is a very interesting word to look at because it sits in the very center of um, the Hebrew alphabet which has 24 letters and we see here the 11th, 12th and 13th letter uh, spell melek but the other in the other direction. So it's first kap, lamet and then mem. Exactly the same actually as it is in the Latin alphabet where it's klm. It's the same letters and also sits uh, more or less in the center. And in the center of that word sits the Lamet. That letter is um, uh, the center of the Hebrew alphabet. It's also the tallest letter. Um, it's the only one that rises above the, the baseline. Uh, it sticks out. In any writing, Hebrew writing, it's always the Lamet that sticks out. There's no other letter that has this. And because of that, it has a nickname in Hebrew. This is Hebrew tradition. It's not Christian. Uh, this is Hebrew tradition. Uh, but w when I say it, you will right away recognize something. This letter, because of its place in the alphabet and its place in these three letters that for form the word king, because of that, the letter Lamet is called, has the nickname, King of Kings. No, you don't make this up. Huh? Uh, it's Melek Ha Melakim, King of Kings. And then that idea is supported by the two letters next to it, the Mem and the Kap. The Kap stands for Kisei Ha Kavot, which means Throne of Glory. And then you have the following letter, the Mem, which stands for Malkut, which is which means kingdom. So the first three letters of the, the name uh, Malkit Zedek uh, do not only say king, but it also means king of kings sitting in his kingdom on the throne of glory. All that is contained in these three letters. But it goes a bit further. If I take out this letter, Lamet, Uh, it looks like a, a, a staff. Uh, it's not by chance. Um, it's um, uh, so that every letter in the Hebrew alphabet is also a word. So the, the letter is called Lamet, but Lamet is also a word with a meaning. Uh, and every letter in the Hebrew alphabet has this, um, this characteristic. For example, uh, the fourth letter is Dalet, like in the Latin alphabet, the letter D, yeah, or in Greek it's Delta. So Dalet, uh, the word Dalet means a door. So, so every letter is not only just a symbol representing a sound, but it's also a word with a meaning. And so the letter Lamet uh, comes from um, uh, yeah, an original word that means um, to prick or to goad 
and that is what the, the shepherd does with his staff um, and so uh, that is that is where it originates from this shape um, so we find also the element of the shepherd here and the root of the word lamet is lamat which means to teach or conversely to learn so it points also to the teacher and to his students now this letter lamet is a very interesting letter in many ways because it's actually made up of two separate letters It's made up of the vav that stands here on top and the cup that we also find here in the word. So it's these two letters stacked together create this new symbol. Now the word cup, the letter cup, has also meaning. The word cup means hand, but it's an, you see from the shape, it's an outstretched hand, an open hand. It's a sign of weakness actually. Um, whereas the word vav, it's also a word, means nail. It's used for hook or tent peg or simply nail. So if you put these two together, they point to the pierced hand, the hand with the nail in it. Uh, that's what it symbolizes. So we find it also here. Now another interesting um, thing is that the... Um, the letters in the Hebrew alphabet also represent numbers. So originally there were no numbers in the Hebrew language. They were represented by the letters. So the, the first letter, uh, Aleph, uh, uh, is one, and then uh, Beth is two, and Gimel is three, and uh, Dalet is four, etc. And then you have some letters that uh, represent higher values, like 50, 100, 400. It's very similar as in ancient Greek. There were also no numbers. The letters represented also numbers. So we have letters that have the symbolic meaning uh, uh, representing sound, uh, where you make a word, but the letters also mean something. They have, they have a meaning, they are words, but they are also numbers. And when we look at the numbers of these two, we see something else that's very interesting. The Vav represents the number 6, and uh, the Kap represents the number 20. So if you add that, it's 26, and then you will say, well, so what? Well, I will show you so what, uh, and I will write down now the very well-known um, um, word used to, uh, to point to God, Yahweh. Uh, and in Hebrew, that is written as follows. So it's Vav He Yod He Yahweh, and these uh, these letters um, obviously have uh, also numerical values, and um, we can write them also. So we see uh, the number 6, eh, that was Vav, and then the He, which is used twice, has the value 5, the number of grace, and the Yod has the value 10. So add this up and you see it's 26, the same as the um, compound value of um, the Vav and the Kap, which means uh, that, um, well, it means we can, we can get this... Um, this, this deeper meaning that the pierced hand of Jesus, eh, the cup and the vav, actually this, uh, this points directly to God. He is God. Uh, moreover, the name uh, Malkitzedek uh, contains seven letters, the number of completion, the number used by God in many ways. Now it has the tallest letter, the lamet, but it also contains the smallest letter, the yod. 
And the yod, uh, like the cup, also means hand. But now it's not an open, outstretched hand, but it is a, a clenched hand, a fist or something, a hand that holds something. And that is actually represents power or might. So you see that the cup represents weakness, but the yod represents power. Now I will put all this together in a moment. Um, but you see how, um, how there is deeper meanings to all of this. Um, that um, all by itself could be coincidences, but if you have so many things pointing to the same, then, then there is more to it, obviously. Now, back to our text in uh, Hebrews uh, 7, there in verse 3, it says that um, he is without father and without mother, without descent, having no beginning or no end. Now, of course, we can interpret this very loosely and say, well, uh, it's, it's unknown, and so therefore, um, therefore the writer wrote it this way. Eh? But it, it doesn't say uh, that his father, mother, or decent was unknown. It says he has none. That's literally and clearly what it says. Neither does he have a beginning or an end. So it's, it's very clear what it means there. And it's also obvious that no human being can say this. No human being can say this. Except one who is the beginning and the end. And we find that, and you know where I'm going, in Revelation 1, verse 8, where Jesus himself says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. He says Alpha and Omega. Alpha and Omega in um, small letters written like this, in uh, Greek capital letters written like this. Alpha and Omega are the first and the last letter of the, uh, the Greek alphabet. Uh, he is saying, I am the beginning and the end, not I have a beginning and, in, and an end. Uh, so basically reflects the same that is written here about Melchizedek in uh, Hebrews 7 verse 3, that he has no beginning of days, nor end of life. Then it adds there in uh, Hebrews 7 verse 3, that he was made, being made like unto the Son of God. That could not be more obvious, I would say. Um, you could add to that, eh, sort of, in comma, who was being made like a son of man, because the Son of God was being made like the Son of Man, like a human being. And here we have a human being who was made like the Son of God. Um, it's sort of the other way around. And the word made, being made, is in, in Greek, uh, aphomiomenos, aphomiomenos, which is a word you use uh, to, to uh, when you you refer to a copy, a model, uh, something that is similar to something else. And what we, what we see actually here is that it wasn't really so that Jesus had Melchizedek's kind of priesthood, but it's more the other way around. Melchizedek has, had Jesus' kind of priesthood. And Melchizedek had to be made like unto the Son of God, because the Son of God had not yet in the history, in the timeline of history, had not yet been manifested as man. Um, so that's why later we see that Jesus, the Son of God, had to be made like unto the Son of Man. And here Melchizedek had to be made like unto the Son of God. Finally, uh, it says that he remains a priest forever. Continually, it says King James, uh, but it really means forever. Continually, throughout time, without end. And we know that there is only one person of whom this can be said. As I said, I will put all this together uh, at the end to, to um, give you a full picture. 
Let's look at um, some other events surrounding uh, Naki Zedek and his impact uh, and interaction with Abram. From Genesis 14, uh, as we read earlier, we see that um, Naki Zedek gave Abram bread and wine right there in Salem or in Jerusalem. Now, if you read that, it should remind you right away of the Last Supper, where Jesus gave bread and wine in Jerusalem. But there's more to it. Let's read from Exodus 12, verses 40 and 41. Now the sojourning of the children of Israel, who dwelt in Egypt, was 430 years. And it came to pass, at the end of the 430 years, even the selfsame day, it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. This tells us that the Exodus was on the selfsame day, that means on the exact same day on the calendar, same date, we would say, as something else 430 years earlier. So what happened 430 years, years earlier? That's the question. For that we go, surprisingly, to the New Testament, to Galatians 3, verses 16 and 17. There it says, Now to Abram and his seed were the promises made. He said not, and to seeds, as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after, cannot this annul that it should make the promise of non-effect. Here it speaks again about 430 years. It says the covenant with Abram, Abram was made. Now there was, are several ways to calculate these 430 years and how long then they stayed exactly in Egypt and all this. There are different theories, the jury is still out on that, but let's simply follow what it says. The Exodus took place on Passover. Obviously, it was the first official Passover, I would say. So it means that if that was on the self same day as this event that Galatians describes, the confirming of the covenant, 430 years earlier to Abram, that means that it also happened on Passover. That means that the encounter with Melchizedek, where Abram was offered bread and wine, was on the night before Passover, and I will show you in a second, because, because of what happened the day after. The day after, uh, the covenant was uh, confirmed. So, so from that uh, day, the, the 430 years start. So on the eve of Passover, the encounter between Melchizedek and um, Abram took place, where bread and wine was offered to Abram. And this parallels exactly the eating of the lamb after putting the blood on the doorpost in Egypt. This was also the eve of Passover, the, the, the evening, and then the following night, and then in the morning the, the exodus would take place. And this parallels the Last Supper with, that Jesus had with his disciples, where he offered them bread and wine, right there in Jeru Jerusalem. Uh, it was also the evening uh, the night after which he would be arrested, the day when the day uh, break, broke, he would be crucified. So, if this indeed parallels the Last Supper, it was on Nissan 14 on the Hebrew calendar, after sunset, the evening, the beginning of the day. And we can know that it was evening because in Genesis 15, verse 5, uh, God tells Abram to look up. Uh, at the stars. Uh, and that can, of course, not happen uh, during daylight. And then, after that, God instructs Abram to take different animals and cut them in half. Now, that, um, that happened the next day. He needed daylight for that, uh, and, and also quite some time. Now, we made a video in the past um, called The Self Same Day, which I will link up here. Um, with uh, de more details on that, uh, also on the timing and on the details on the meaning of the um, of the different animals and why they had to be cut in half, except for the the, the doves that were there, etc. So, so you can find more details on that in uh, the video, the self same day. 
So again, um, the meeting with Melchizedek was on Nisan 14 after sunset. Um, on the Hebrew calendar, the sun uh, after sunset or at sunset, the day begins. So it was the beginning of the day, sunset, uh, just when dark had come. Um, then the next day he would put all these uh, animals um, out as God instructed. And then as the sun was going down, it says in Genesis 15 verse 12, so that's the end of Nisan 14, then there was great darkness, just as there was great darkness when Jesus was on the cross. And Abram is being put into a deep sleep. And while this happens, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp are passing in between the animal halves. And we read uh, in Genesis uh, 15 verse 17, And it came to pass that when the sun went down and it was dark, behold, a smoking furnace and a burning lamp that passed between those pieces. And this burning lamp and the smoking furnace, they uh, represent God the Father and Jesus the Son. The latter sealing the covenant on Abram's behalf. The whole ritual there, again, explain it in the video the self same day, but it was an ancient way of sealing a covenant, cutting one or more animals in half, and then both parties would walk in between and would declare that the one who would break the covenant, uh, this person would befall the same fate as these animals and be cut in pieces. And so we see that God put Abram in his sleep and he does it himself. He is the burning um, or the smoking furnace and Jesus is also fire of the same essence. He is God. He is the burning lamp that goes in Abram's stead. So that's why um, Galatians 3 verse 17 says that the covenant was confirmed before God in Christ. It's, it's exactly confirming this. Um, and it speaks there, the context is the covenant made with Abram. That's Galatians 3 verse 16. And all this happened at the same day, same date, I would say, and, this, and the same time and the same place as Jesus' sacrifice would take place many uh, ages later uh, to seal the new covenant. So it's magnificent what we, what we find here. Now let's put things together in order to get a good profile of Melchizedek or Malkitzedek. We see that he is the king of righteousness. Sadek means righteousness. He is the king of peace, Salem, Shalom. He is the king of Jerusalem. He has no beginning and no end. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is both king and priest, a unique combination that we do not find anywhere else, actually. He is also a priest forever. And he is made like the Son of God. He gives bread and wine on Pesach in Jerusalem. That's what we get from Scripture. If we add some meaning that we get from the, his name and the characters used, we find he is king of kings, we find the pierced hand, uh, we find that that crucified man equals Yahweh, God. He sits on the throne of glory, Kisai HaKavet, in his kingdom, Malkut. He is a shepherd, a teacher. He has come to lay down his life, but he is also uh, representing power and might. Malki Tzedek has seven letters, the number of completion. It can only leave us with one conclusion. Malki Tzedek is Jesus. He is an Old Testament Christophany. That's also what it says. He was made like unto the Son of God. And after all, Jesus was not born 
in this world yet, when Melchizedek appeared to Abram, Jesus had not been born into this world. He had not been manifested yet as man. So this is really what we call a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus, of which, by the way, there are quite a few to be found in the Old Testament. If you doubt all this, there is another way to look at all of this, because it says about Melchizedek that he is a priest forever. That means he was a priest also during Jesus' first advent on this earth. And it means he is a priest even today. Uh, forever is forever. But it's also said that Jesus is our eternal high priest. That means that Melchizedek and Jesus, that if Melchizedek and Jesus would not be the same person, then there would be two high priests at the same time. And that is not possible. So, Melchizedek and Jesus are one and the same person. And this is why Paul goes through great lengths to explain the topic of Jesus being high priest after the order of Melchizedek. He's really revealing a, a magnificent mystery here. The Levitical priesthood was merely a shadow of that. And this will be addressed in the, in the rest of this chapter. And then everything will be concluded in 8. So again, this is a beautiful, beautiful um, picture, that uh, puzzle, you can say, of which God gives us here the pieces to put them together. And uh, we find uh, this wonderful um, revelation. Um, so the rest of the chapter goes into more details uh, about the relationship between this pre priesthood of Jesus and the priesthood, uh, the Levitical priesthood, and how law relates to the new covenant. I hope this was a blessing, and uh, I leave it at this for now. Amen. Amen.